Okay, hi guys. Welcome everyone. Welcome to today's webinar. Um, I'm really excited to have Ron um, from Moto Science join us today. Uh, a lot of ground to cover. I've been having a couple of conversations with Rigang in the past few days, and I think uh, uh, this is going to be a really interesting talk, largely for one reason, that uh, given the kind of work that Rigang does, it takes him around the world and uh, in, in uh, conversations with uh, regulators and the industry, um, literally in, you know, everywhere. And uh, because of which, he has a, a very good sense of you know, the regulatory kind of mindset on some of the emerging issues and especially the mindset to the risk uh, in the crypto industry. Uh, anybody from the industry knows that AML and CFT risk is largely um, the, the kind of the big bottleneck for the industry. And uh, uh, you know, I've always believed that problems created by technology can be best solved not by regulation, but, but through technology. That is exactly the kind of uh, exactly where Megang comes into the scene. He's he is and his company is a pioneer in blockchain and uh, blockchain forensics and diligence. They have been uh, pretty, making these tools, which are used by regulators, by the crypto exchanges, by banks and funds and law enforcement agencies uh, in multiple countries. So uh, I'm going to essentially uh, you know start Mrigang with uh, letting you explain a little bit, uh, you know, explain the, uh, explaining the products to us. Uh, what is it? What is the offering? Just uh, let's start with that, and then I'll uh, take it forward from there. Sure, sure. Hey, so hi everyone. Uh, so thanks Anirudh for the awesome introduction. And yeah, just like Amri Gank, the CEO of Merkle Science. Uh, before we started Merkle Science, so Merkle Science is about like two years old now. Uh, we work with some of the leading exchanges all across, as well as work lies very closely with regulators, as well as law enforcement for a variety of activity regarding crypto crime. And um, in terms of my background, I previously actually worked in investment banking, but right before Mogul Science, I worked for a cryptocurrency exchange. So um, it's coming right down to Anirudh's question, uh, what does Merkel Science do? So Merkel Science provides a, uh, I mean, basically we provide tools to detect, investigate, and prevent illegal use of cryptocurrencies. So now what, what does this mean? I'm sure you have a lot of questions in your head right now. So typically um, we have like two major tools. One is a crypto AML tool and the other one is a blockchain forensics tool that's primarily used by law enforcement agencies and regulators. So um, uh, in the cryptocurrency world, every uh, transaction is published on the blockchain. Now, you know addresses that are sending transactions, you know that address A sends funds to address B, but you do not know what entities um, are involved, like which entity address A comes from, or which entity does address B belong to. So Merkle Science is a data science company which uh, primarily uh, uses a different de-anonymization techniques, cybersecurity techniques to label uh, entities uh, or blockchain addresses. And now for cryptocurrency exchanges, it's very simple. When they receive incoming cryptocurrencies or when their customers need to withdraw cryptocurrency funds, these cryptocurrency exchanges need to make sure that these funds don't come from an illegal or a blockchain address belonging to a criminal, such as a ransomware address, a darknet address, or um, even something like the, a sanctions list, like the US OFAC had published a sanctions list of bad blockchain addresses. So they screen our tran their transactions through our platform and get a risk rating through us. For uh, law enforcement agencies, it works the other way around. Like uh, I think cryptocurrency hacks happen all the time, cryptocurrency hacks and scams. So when uh, typically either individuals or companies report this to law enforcement, and when they investigate these hacks and scams, they uh, look up um, like these um, cryptocurrency wallets and they try and figure out which exchange these funds are getting liquidated at. So using Merkle Science, they can try and track which funds it gets liquidated at. So I, I mean, to make it simpler for those guys who don't know blockchain, I even have like a small uh, screen, like a few diagrams I just made up to make it seem easy to understand. So um, yeah, very simply put, so this is a cryptocurrency exchange. It doesn't know where its deposits or withdrawals, its cryptocurrency deposits or withdrawals are coming from. 
So Merkle Science de-anonymizes this. They know that this particular deposit uh, came from terrorist financing, this particular withdrawal went to a hacker, and typically then these exchanges can either block these funds or report them to the local regulator. And for law enforcement, typically, like say this is a hacker, and he's stolen funds and then transferred it to a blockchain address, transferred it to another blockchain address. So law enforcement is looking for as much information as possible on uh, how to catch this criminal. So using Merkle Science, they find out that this is a crypto business and they get in touch with the crypto business directly to try and get information on the criminal or personally identifiable information so that they can um, either get hold of the funds or uh, arrest, like get more information on the criminal to execute an arrest. Great, Mikhail. A picture is worth a million words. Can you unravel the science behind this Alexa piece? How does this really work? Yeah, definitely, definitely. I, um, I mean, uh, like, I guess a large portion of it is a data collection game. So, um, as well as we need to build models to expand and verify these data sets. So we have different teams, um, like some allocated to darknet marketplaces, one allocated to, um, like one allocated typically to um, exchanges, one allocated to other entities such as ransomware and malware. So each of these teams decipher certain methods, A, of data collection, as well as um, B, like they build out models to expand on that data that is collected. So they, um, I mean, a lot of it is our secret source and like, like R&D, so I can't reveal that, but um, uh, that's how they keep collecting addresses or entities or details of these addresses and entities, and they correlate each of them over time. And we also build in heuristics and different models to determine like a broader range of addresses than what is available on the internet. We have partnerships with um, like some uh, nonprofit organizations, law enforcement agencies, as well as investigators uh, who also feed in some of this data for us to use. And um, that's what forms like our blacklists as well as a comprehensive database of addresses seen again. Would it be fair to say it works a little bit like, uh, say, TrueCaller? I mean, and I, and I use that example because the audience understands how TrueCaller works. So basically, once you have identified a certain source, right, uh, then you start building your database, and uh, and every time you have, you know, some kind of uh, uh, some kind of information that points you back to that source, you're able to flag it. Right. Uh, so I mean, you could definitely use the analogy of TrueCaller. Except that like, you won't be able to make out that the blockchain address comes from Anirudh's address. You know that it like, either comes from an exchange or it comes from um, a criminal's wallet address. Like, in some cases, you might know the name, but in most cases, you would just know an entity. Sure, understood, understood. And so it is ultimately the success of your offering depends on the quality of the database that you've built over a period of time as well, right? Uh, Yes, uh, to a certain extent, it definitely depends on the database. But uh, according to us, like the blockchain is getting even more complicated. Criminal activity is getting more complicated. There are privacy protocols and like privacy coins coming about. So um, we're also building the next generation of rules, like where we can like just predict whether a blockchain wallet is suspicious based on its prior activity. So um, it's. I think the industry started off with a database check, but is moving more towards a rule-based predictive model as well. Sure. So the database kind of uh, technique is a little bit, uh, you know, thing of the past. But uh, but I would still want to ask you uh, if if uh, uh, you know does that mean that is is there enough of information sharing between industry players, between exchanges, between regulators to ensure that there's a critical mass of information uh, to enable this? So it's it's actually not like uh, most of this information, even if we receive it from any of these players, would be much after an event has occurred. So typically, most of these entities consider this as like private like data, and uh, until they're com like completely out of the woods with that case, they wouldn't be comfortable disclosing this data. So, um, but I guess there are definitely groups out there like. There are certain Telegram groups or WhatsApp groups where they try and promote active collaboration, but um, I think there's still a long way to go on that. Sure, sure. Have you seen an increase in demand for forensics? 
during this entire COVID crisis and the lockdown, I, I, my, my sense is that there has been an increase in fraud and extortion. Is that something uh, that you're seeing as well? Um, so I think there's definitely been an increase in crypto crimes. So I think that like we see a lot of new criminal activity related to ransomware or malware, which is COVID related impersonations of WHO or like, like different government agencies, um, even like government agencies, like the Indian, like hackers imitating the Indian government or like putting a picture of Narendra Modi and asking for like donations in Bitcoin uh, for, for like migrant workers in India who are suffering due to the COVID crisis. So there's definitely an increase in crime in uh, terms of adoption for uh, the like cryptocurrency businesses like uh, over the last one year we've definitely seen a more steady rise in terms of business now that's because of cryptocurrency regulation uh, across the world like there's the FATF guidelines that have come up and they uh, like prior to this they are a deadline of june and like world over regulators have deadlines more or less in 2020 for either regulating cryptocurrencies or like putting tighter AML CFT regulations on top of the existing regime. So we've seen an adoption, but uh, at least uh, like definitely an adoption due to increased crime, but more due to like regulation that happens despite COVID. Interesting. And um, what, what is the kind of success rate for, uh, you know, for uh, say a forensics uh, project that you undertake? How long does it take to conclude a project? I, and I know you can't give any kind of precise clear answer that will depend on the complexity of the situation, et cetera. But still, if you could give me a sense, maybe anecdotally, that would help. Uh, sure. So I actually, like, there is no fixed timeline. It depends on the difficulty of the project. So the fastest one could be done, like, say, in a few hours or a few days. And some more complex ones happen, like, in phases where the, we get some aspect of the information now, then some like a month later, and we incorporate that and uh, try and get more data, et cetera. So it could take from like like a few days to a, like uh, about a month. Okay. So never. a complex case. Yeah. Or never as well. Yeah. Right. And what is the kind of, uh, what's the level of automation uh, that you've been able to build in these kind of products? Because I understand that uh, exchanges, for example, banks, for example, also use some of your uh, risk monitoring tools, right? Uh, I mean, uh, maybe you can speak a little bit about the kind of uh, tools that are in use and, uh, and the level of automation as well. I mean, does it require people manning these tools at all times or it just you know, works on its own automatically kind of monitoring the risk? Yeah, so uh, I mean, our tools are primarily based um, for as much automation as possible. It's geared towards trying to reduce, um, at least for the exchanges and banks, it's geared towards reducing compliance costs and time. So 90, I'd say 90% of, of it is automated. Like if you, you just need to input your wallet addresses that you want to monitor. And on a daily basis, there is, this is monitored again and again and screened through our like existing database. And uh, most of the tasks are automated. Just, uh, I believe some amount of like human element is required in the last stage where once you've gotten the risk, the compliance team needs to decide how uh, serious the risk is as per their own compliance policy and how they need to act on it. So these two things typically require some amount of human intervention, but um, over time we, as like um, things mature, this will also probably get automated. But uh, for this aspect, we also provide a service such as a compliance analyst as a service in case you're struggling to figure out what to do or why this particular address has been flagged. We can actually give you more information about it um, uh, using like if you use a compliance analyst as a service and then you can uh, typically use that directly to then make a call. So you don't need your compliance officer to sit on our tool for two days to figure it out. Sure. Understood. So I'm going to switch gears now and talk a little bit, little bit about uh, banking. Um, and, uh, you know, access to banking globally has been, has been a challenge in India. Of course, we, we had to battle this out for a good two years. And uh, you know, some of us are taking a long way involved in that verdict as well, in, in that matter at the Supreme Court as well. But generally banks, I mean, irrespective of uh, you know, this, uh, the, the kind of regulatory approach towards, uh, towards banking and crypto industry, banks also are very conservative. And they are because you know, banking is a regulated industry. They are worried about uh, AML and CFT risks that they, that they expose 
themselves to. So I want to understand how banks are using some of these tools. And are they, because of the availability of these tools now, are banks more comfortable uh, in, in servicing the crypto industry? Sure, sure. So uh, I'll, I can definitely answer both your questions. So um, uh, I think uh, like in, from an India specific perspective, I, I don't think banks are using such tools right now because um, like the crypto regulation is still far behind. There isn't as much clarity, but uh, definitely in like more developed markets like the US where there is a framework, a licensing framework for cryptocurrency companies, or like say in the EU where there's a rich, rich ecosystem of challenger banks, um, these challenger banks, as well as like banks who are trying to recognize that like fintech is becoming a huge segment they need to cater to as well as cryptocurrency companies. And um, uh, like while there is definitely a friction, they are getting about to it. Like with any new technology, any risk, uh, I think most in industries wait till uh, like those businesses grow big. But there are definitely billion dollar businesses that are cryptocurrency businesses. So banks do bank them, but it depends on the outlook of senior management in those banks as well as like their framework, right? If they're a global bank, then they need to make sure that this policy is consistent across. But if they're like a local bank, it might be a little easier for them to adapt quicker, um, like especially in geographies like Singapore, where it's much quicker to adapt to regulatory policy if they're a local bank in Singapore. So, um, so I think... I mean, we've seen challenger banks actively get into the space because they want to cater to new segments as well. And uh, that itself is like a big push to these banks who want to then, who then realize that they're losing out a big chunk of business and want to get into this. In, um, I would say that is push number one. But then like once they decide that they want to explore this segment, so that crypt they want to bank fintech companies dealing with cryptocurrency or crypto the cryptocurrency segment, then they... Then the next task for them is like super, very complicated as to how to go about doing it. That's where AML CFT tools such as ours come in. We typically, um, I mean, they plug in their partner exchanges or their clients onto our platform and we monitor them on an ongoing basis. And before they onboard a client, they also do a report with us called a KYBB report, a know your blockchain business report. So that gives all risks like cryptocurrency or blockchain related risks specific to those businesses that they're looking at. So they use this as a part of their onboarding compliance process. Interesting. I wonder if, uh, so one is of course that the banks can choose to use these tools to diligence a crypto exchange that they want to onboard as a client, right? Yes. That's one part. But have you ever seen exchanges voluntarily coming to you they like run a diligence on us, prepare a diligence report, which we can take to the bank to give them the comfort uh, for onboarding us. Uh, yes, actually that happens uh, very often where exchanges do come to us and um, even some of our users typically come to us and ask um, for like such reports or uh, help with such reports. And they also ask us to prepare such reports for a hack that might have happened so that they can submit it to like law enforcement or uh, some of the other entities that they're dealing with. So uh, banks and payment providers as well. Like, so payment providers are money services business. So uh, in the Indian context, I think I had read somewhere that MobiQuick is planning to bank cryptocurrency companies. So typically- yeah, these, They are actually active, yes. Yeah, so like these, they provide these fiat ramps to these companies, right? And um, Basically, on account of that, they're, they're also highly regulated. Like they have a lot, they have a lot of licenses and are regulated by the central bank. So they also try and encourage their customers to use tools like this or um, like get reports like this for any customers they onboard. Because uh, a lot of our clients uh, do struggle with get, getting banking in Singapore, for example. And this may be a, a possible, it's, it's probably a good idea to explore, which is that you, know, you voluntarily get yourself diligence and uh, uh, and try and get the banks more comfortable right so they do this in multiple ways actually they also contact some of the bigger auditors do like security tests and uh, this is an addendum to that they say that they've also done an aml check and here is the aml report of the last few years and and these are the compliance processes interesting now Srigang, since you interact with banks across different regions right uh tell me about uh, what what, uh, in what regions do you think, uh, do you think uh, banks are taking a more liberal approach 
to the crypto industry? Which countries have the most accessible banking uh, for the industry? Um, well, I uh, I do see that there's a lot of innovation going on in Eastern Europe specifically, and uh, any geography where there's regulations that have come about, there's a proper licensing process, then uh, banks definitely do bank cryptocurrency companies. This is across the world, right? Like in New York, as there's a license for cryptocurrency companies, uh, or um, like even in London, there are definitely some banks that are open to it, as well as Singapore, but um, they do set the bar very high when they onboard cryptocurrency companies. The rationale being that the risk, the additional risk that they're taking should be outweighed by the business that they get from this company. Certainly. But, um, so, so I, I completely agree with you. The, the more evolved the regulatory framework, uh, the more comfortable banks will be in providing services. Uh, but do you think regulation, if, I mean, does does regulation solve that pro problem completely? Because we've seen that even in jurisdictions where there is more evolved regulation, banks still continue to play foul. Banks are still extremely yeah. conservative, um, uh, and sometimes a lot more conservative than the regular regulators themselves. So, why is it? Do, I mean, one, do you agree with this? And second, why is it? And third, uh, uh, do you see that at least? Can you give me one example of one or two geographies where um, where banks are truly, truly welcoming? Uh, uh, the industry. So, uh, bigger banks are not always welcoming of the industry, and this is true across, right? Which is why there is the existence of crypto-focused banks, even like in literally every single cryptocurrency hub in the world. There are crypto-focused banks in the U.S. Uh, there are crypto-focused banks in uh, like EU, I think, uh, like the Silvergate in the U.S., Signum, Seba in Switzerland, and. Um, I believe like now there, there's at least a list of 20 to 30 banks that are like crypto focused or focused on cryptocurrency companies. And uh, I, I think you're right that like um, regulations is one of like several criteria that they see and just regulations isn't sufficient for banks to get into this industry. But um, I think it's primarily like the size of the business, like as time progresses, there is more awareness about cryptocurrency. There is less aversion to it as well. As you get more and more knowledge, you see legitimate companies coming out of it, um, etc. There's less aversion. And also, like I think over time, they want to adapt. They don't want to lose out business. So as cryptocurrency businesses become bigger, banks will adapt and bank them um, so that they don't lose their business. Sure. And where do you think these crypto-focused banks are able to do what other banks are um, are, are not willing to touch. Is it is it largely that is, is it largely a question of um, strategy? It's a strategic call uh, that you you agree to take a you know have a larger risk appetite for the industry, and uh, uh, you know, or is there more to it? Um, I I think it's more around us. Uh, it's definitely like part of their strategy, right? Like they um, uh, like they want to become a digital bank, digital only bank and starting with a cryptocurrency segment often makes sense for them. And for some, they actually believe that just the cryptocurrency segment is big enough for them to become a global bank anyways. Sure. And, uh, has less competition, so it's a new space, so you, that's why you see this. But uh, they typically back this strategy with a lot of technology, right? So uh, they, not only do they use like AML, KYC tools, they need to have a very experienced in-house team of both um, crypto experts or blockchain experts, as well as AML CFT experts who can work together and evolve to create or move fast to adapt to these kind of um, change in regulations et cetera, as well. Change in regulations and change in technology on the other end of the blockchain. Interesting. Now tell me, how do the regulators choose to work with you? Sure, so um, I think there are two ways in which they work with us. So a a lot of them um, like use tools such as ours, or they use our tools to uh, just like get an idea of different like segments, different cryptocurrency exchanges, their volumes, as well as like a risk profile for these exchanges. And um, but yes, the, I would say that like that's that's still a maturing industry, and there is a second segment of government agencies that typically at this stage just get trainings from us, like a lot of agencies in India, for example. Um, they're still exploring this and they haven't moved into this actively. So typically they would um, ask for like a training session on cryptocurrencies. How can um, crypto kind be prevented? How does your tool 
provide like AML CFT functions to prevent it. So I guess these are the two aspects. They directly use the tool sometimes, or they like opt for trainings to try and understand and use the tool over the next like six months to a year when they actually have a strategy or a plan in place for cryptocurrency. Okay. Are you, um, are you able to comment on general trends in, in regulation? Uh, you know, uh, how are regulatory approaches across the world evolving? Any, any patterns that you see? Um, so I guess the biggest pattern that I see is that regulations are becoming stricter. So um, back when I had joined the cryptocurrency industry, this wasn't too many years back, but like something around 2015, 2016. I think regulators took an uncertain stance. They would not give regulatory clarity. They would not, um, um, they would like definitely put out like a circular saying that like customers should be aware of the risks that come out with cryptocurrency investing. And, uh, but they would not, not give any stance to the like cryptocurrency businesses on whether they can exist, what they can do. But, um, in, in the, in the crypto world is a lifetime, right? So much has changed in just two years. Exactly. But now I think like there is um, like India is still one of the countries where there's no clear stance, but most of the countries have a very clear stance, like um, closer to home, like Singapore, Philippines, Malaysia, all have licenses that they give to like cryptocurrency companies and then like larger Asia as well. Like in Japan, uh, there is also a license to be a cryptocurrency business. You need a license from the financial regulator. And at the very least, they put out very strong uh, guidelines for any cryptocurrency businesses that operate in this geography. And I'm, um, ac according to me, in the next two to three years, it will just become a norm. Every country needs to have stringent guidelines in place. That's because of the FATF. So the FATF has published strict like AML guidelines and uh, regulations rega regarding like cryptocurrency businesses, or virtual asset service providers, as they call it. And um, this will typically have to be implemented by all FAD of member countries. So that's 90% or 95% of the countries in the world. I would just like to uh, take a jab at your observation that India has no clear stance. I think they have a very clear stance. They're just not having it their way. <laughs> uh, I, I mean, like, I, I, I'm sure you would have more information about this than us, but I, I was under the impression that like um, over time they do, like there are different stakeholders here and it's a lot more complicated than just an anti-stance. And um, like, I think most regulators that way, it is just a more complicated issue to deal with and they have other bigger problems as well. So the procrastination is the approach they take. And even if it's an anti-stance, it's not like they want to hamper innovation. It's like they need some more time to figure this out. So that's all. I think that's my interpretation of it all, but yeah, I mean, I'm sure people differ in the group or attendees. So sure, it's an anti-stance, but driven by the wrong reasons, driven by, uh, I think, a, a very high risk aversion uh, by a lethargy to kind of um, understand the, the the technology and how it can be used in a in a safe and meaningful way, um, and uh, you know, choosing not to consult with the industry, etc. I can go on and on about this, Megan. So I I think I'll. Uh, <laughs> I'll, uh, I'll stop here. But um, uh, you mentioned earlier that you know most regulators have timelines uh, to adopt regulation. I, th I find that very interesting. Could you could you elaborate on that a little bit? I mean, what kind of timelines are you seeing? Which countries have explicitly come up with timelines? Who are di who's dictating these timelines? Um, uh, you know, some of that stuff. Right. So um, I think most countries have come up with an extensive timeline. So in Singapore. Uh, June 30th is the deadline to apply for a payments license, like pay, like a license called the DPT license, which applies to cryptocurrency companies. And um, like, uh, I was just reading that like uh, the Dutch regulators have given like notice till May 18th for all cryptocurrency businesses to register with them. So I think they all have like a timeline, which is corresponding to this year or the end of this year, all across Europe as well. There is a timeline in terms of like, uh, I think they start in like phases first, maybe they give like a certain grace period where they make all cryptocurrency businesses register with them. And then they move on to actual like a licensing process as such for all um, businesses in their region. Um, so like the timelines go, I don't remember the exact dates, but almost all of them like coincide with like either end of this year or like sometime in the next six months. 
Sure. Um, and um, what, what are you seeing in, in the African continent? Are you, uh, uh, because uh, clearly uh, the, you know, we, we see a surge in, in usage, but have you, uh, have you been tracking mostly the, the industry there? And uh, do you see that the regulatory approach there is evolving a little bit as well? Uh, sure. So I, um, I mean, I, I don't actively deal with that market, but um, we do have a few clients from there. So I think South Africa has, um, I, I was, I think there was an article about South Africa regulating cryptocurrencies or is like, close to coming up with regulations for them. But um, like, the, I, uh, I'm not aware of the others as such per se, but I, I do think that like, most African countries are also FATF member countries, so they don't have a choice because the FATF monitoring or like deadline for implementation is like um, coming up. So they would have to implement uh, some sort of format for, if not a full fledged licensing, or at least AML CFT norms for them. We're definitely seeing some movement, and I'll, I'll just share a, an article recently authored by us on, on Nigeria, the Nigerian approach which is interestingly very similar that they're going down the same path as India did. Uh, and I think that's why I find it very interesting because there are learnings from India, which can be taken to the continent as well. But uh, yeah, just, I've just shared the, the piece. Uh, tell me, um, uh, could, you, could you also uh, specifically uh, you know, uh, comment on Estonia and Malta, which have been, of course, I mean, the crypto industry, the, the darlings of the crypto industry for a while. But honestly, despite all the hullabaloo, I don't see too much uh, uh, too much really happening there of late. So could could you uh, could you comment on, on these two jurisdictions in particular if if you've been tracking? Uh, sure. So I think like um, I mean they are definitely still preferred jurisdictions. I think with Estonia, I saw that like there's even a revision of the current like um, AML like CFT or the current licensing process. There were a lot of companies applying for it from all across. They've actually made the bar higher. And um, we actually see a lot of companies like either like with an Estonian license or looking to it like uh, for the purpose of a cryptocurrency license. So uh, I would say that like it's like whatever they've done has worked. Like it's gained the attention of the world and people are registering a lot of exchanges there. And uh, it's similar in Malta as well. Like, um, of course, there might have been a more of a hype because these things take time. But there is very proactive uh, regulation in all these geographies, both in terms of like, like there are two types of regulators, right? A regulators that do not issue any guidelines whatsoever and B regulators that issue guidelines as well as have a licensing process. So these, both these geographies have like very clear directives from the government on what you should do, what you should not do if you are a cryptocurrency business and how and what like you need to do. Uh, like, are you like applicable for a license, eligible for a license? And how do you go about applying for a license as well? Sure. Now tell me uh, uh, that of the four segments that I have broadly identified that you cater to, which is the crypto exchanges, the regulators, law enforcement agency, banks slash funds. Um, would it be right that law enforcement agencies are the biggest kind of uh, constituting the biggest consumer base for you? Is, 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 that, is that a fair thing to say? Um, I think that was true in the past, but actually like cryptocurrency companies as well as banks would be an equally large customer base because the new like fintech, uh, again, like I think you don't see this much in India, but uh, like we see this in Singapore where uh, every or some of the largest fintech companies are all cryptocurrency companies. I'm using companies and not like exchanges because that's a broader definition. So payment networks, asset management firms, OTC desks market makers so uh, all these companies there's a rich ecosystem of this across the world as well and uh, these are turning out to be the fastest growing segment as well understood understood how do investment funds uh, work with you guys so uh, it would depend on uh, whether they have cryptocurrency exposure or not so like if they accept cryptocurrency from any of their clients like it they could be retail clients or institutional clients then they need to use our tool to monitor incoming cryptocurrencies and outgoing cryptocurrencies. So that's how they work with us. Okay. Okay. It's very similar to how an exchange just monitors its retail clients or institutional clients. Sure. So I'm going to zoom out a little bit and ask you about the future of blockchain diligence and forensics. What's, what's, 
um, uh, what, what are we waiting for um, in the next two years, in the next five years, to the extent you have visibility? And I ask because I honestly feel that the future of diligence slash forensics is going to be intricately linked with the future of blockchain itself. Because, uh, because with these kind of tools and technologies, we can give regulators more comfort, uh, banks more comfort, then the overall environment will become more, uh, more uh, you know, kind of appealing for this technology. So uh, could you guide us there? Uh, so I think tools are going to become more complex because the blockchain is going to become more complex. Uh, I think a lot of privacy protocols will come into the picture and even Bitcoin, Ethereum, the like better known cryptocurrencies will also have privacy protocols to hide your on-chain transactions. So the way of doing like AML for like blockchain on-chain monitoring would like evolve as well. Like you would look at not just whether it's like it's there is some exposure to taint, like taint being like bad funds, but you would also look at um, patterns, like such as frequency, transaction volumes, to determine if a wallet is suspicious or not. At, at this point, uh, all of a lot of this is still um, in the experimental stage, but very well developed in the financial services space. So, like PayPal uses this in e-commerce or uh, all of their payments, and banks use multiple tools for this purpose. So, uh, we see that happening in uh, like the blockchain monitoring industry as well, that um, like uh, things would become a lot more predictive and behavior based rather than purely um, like uh, like database based. Certainly. Talking about the future and um, you know there's obviously you know constantly the the uh, technology around privacy demands or anonymization uh, privacy coins for example is evolving right um, on the and at the same time, your uh, forensics and diligence technology is evolving. Who's going to win? <laughs> um, well, I think we'll catch up. Will it always be a challenge? We'll have to uh, we'll have to keep grappling with. So, I mean, I could like just like like lie and tell you that like we will win, but like uh, in most like cases, even in traditional finance, the criminals are always one step ahead. Like uh, they tend to have like the most. Uh, because it's easier to commit a crime than to unravel it, right? And um, so, uh, like, and especially in the blockchain, like, there are very smart, because it's not, like, at least anonymization techniques aren't necessarily criminal activity, right? It's it's also just, like, privacy-centered or privacy-centric. So um, there are some very smart people in the world um, who are working on that. So I think how the industry will move is just, like, they catch up to this. You will never be able to catch the like smartest one percent of criminals, but like you keep adapting over time, over time, and like get to like eighty percent, ninety percent, ninety nine ninety to ninety five percent. Talking about the talking about smart crime and smart criminals, uh, could you, from your experience, talk about some really bizarre crime that uh, or or something that got you guys uh, really you know kind of caught up? It, just just something interesting. Um, sure, sure. So I, uh, I mean, I can't think of a particular case, but I think we see all kinds, like, um, some of the more interesting ones are definitely where the criminal has been very silly. Like, I think, um, like there's a misconception among criminals that Bitcoin is anonymous. And if you commit crime in Bitcoin, you can't be tracked. So, um, we've, we've had a multitude of these like small time criminals, like the like kidnappers or ransomware who, um, who um, like end up taking ransom in Bitcoin, but like very casually just liquidate funds out of an exchange. And they don't realize that like if you, they don't observe any sort of privacy protocols, then like they would get caught very easily if they've liquidated from an exchange. And they're giving a bunch of IP data to the exchange as well. So um, I think one that comes to my mind is like this kidnapping in Malaysia where a woman got kidnapped. And uh, it was very easy to determine, like the criminal literally used a Malaysian exchange as well. So it was very easy to determine parameters for like tracking him down. So I think, well, I'm not allowed to disclose anything here. Like, uh, like it was very easy to get like, like details such as IP addresses, etc., cetera, um, which could be used to track down the criminal. And another, I mean, like I'm trying to think of other notable cases as such. Um, but but yeah, I think like more often than not, they like like they're they're pretty like organized, but they make like one or two small mistakes. 
so that's that's when it like um, it's they there's um, they give up their identity or they get like caught and um, secondly i think like the ways in which this is being done is getting more and more sophisticated i think now criminals are also realizing that you can't like you can't just directly use exchanges so then like they're using like a new segment like decentralized exchanges anything that's like remotely centralized or like very regulation focused typically um, they know that like these guys aren't the safest to use so they even send like criminals send test amounts to different exchanges sometimes to see if their funds get blocked in that exchange so uh, in that sense a lot of things are evolving over like and it's quite like amazing to see the speed at which it's evolving as well sure you mentioned about privacy coins a little bit uh, earlier so how are the regulators responding to uh, this desire for privacy coins are the regulators kind of uh, clamping down or uh, you know pushing back um, on, on the use of privacy coins or yeah, so i think um, i mean this is a bit of a controversial topic with the cryptocurrency industry but uh, i definitely see that uh, regulators um, like in most geographies they have they tend to either approve a fixed set of or to get started with they approve a few cryptocurrencies that are okay and they categorically mention that you need to be wary of like either they categorically say don't onboard privacy coins if you want to be licensed by us or they um, give like some sort of statutory uh, warning where like you need to make sure or report to us or be very wary of any transactions you receive from either like where there's been a pre privacy coin like conversion or even like um, if it's come from like a coin mixer or a de uh, or an anonymization uh, like tool such as that you need to be very wary of those cryptocurrencies sure someone's asked on the chat if they have figured out any way to track privacy centric coins like monero or zcash right. so uh, i mean this there's a lot of um, like research going into it as well like if you just go online and google it you'll see a lot of research we incorporate a lot of this research but um, i think all of it is quite probabilistic and um, it, it's very difficult on those coins to figure out like like to do things the same way as we do on chain monitoring like at least for the time being and if there's like any major breakthroughs i mean uh, I, my hypothesis is it'll probably have to be a different method that is used for those coins as compared to on chain monitoring on chain monitoring is just not as accurate for those those coins or it i mean a different way of determining like uh, identities or entities the same way wouldn't work sure uh, there are two questions here which uh, uh, which i'll take one by one um uh, yash asks how can government agencies limit the consequences of illicit transactions by bad actors without the existence of a government backdoor and undermining the decentralized nature of cryptocurrencies uh, sure i think that's a pretty good question um, like that's asked like quite a few times to like companies like ours as well so um, so i think there has to be a limit on everything like even to freedom right like while um, uh, all our constitutions give us the right to freedom we can't go out and do everything we want to do right so the, even the government has to find a fine line like between giving freedom or innovation via cryptocurrencies but making sure that they um, prevent criminal activity just because cryptocurrencies are decentralized it also promotes like it while it promotes innovation it also promotes criminal activity and that's like where they need to draw the line or like decide on policy where like it's okay if you're if you're trying a fintech startup it might be okay for you to like experiment cryptocurrency lending but when it comes to you setting up a business with a child pornography and you're accepting cryptocurrency transactions they're going to clamp down on that right so um, i mean it does undermine the decentralized nature to a certain extent but i i think it's fairly reasonable to say that like there needs to be a balance struck between both sure arushi asks is the solution applicable to unhosted wallets as well and how does it manage data protection issues uh, right so um like it would be applicable to uh, blockchain wallets typically if it's a private wallet which you're asking i think that's what you're asking um if it's a private wallet then it's very difficult for us to correlate to an entity unless that entity is known to have committed a crime in the past right then like then we have different sources which publish malware ransomware 
and get like malware addresses from different sources. So if it's committed crime, then like we might have some tag for it. And uh, typically we have tags for like any criminal activity that are private wallets, or we have like any crypto businesses or crypto services out there. And uh, in terms of data protection issues, so um, I mean, this is a longer conversation, but typically we encourage customers to only um, use uh, like non customer identifiable information, like um, just the blockchain addresses or blockchain wallets. In case they need to send us any sensitive data, then we definitely do have security as well as compliance policies in place to adhere to like, like the different requirements, different data pol policies and uh, geographies we operate in. Uh, there's another quest question. Are there new ways of laundering crypto which have propped up in your experience? Um, I, I think like, like the broader categories are still like the same. Like, I would say that the most popular ones are still uh, mixers, uh, exchanges, exchanges with low KYC, low KYC. Um, as like the industry is learning, I would say most of the crime is still in those like more common avenues. And in terms of like new technology, each of these entities has like subtypes and new and new technology for like each type actually keeps emerging all the time. So like new protocols, new, um, uh, new companies which do this as well. So that, like, I mean, I can't think of any specific name, but like, you, this happens on an ongoing basis. You know, one of the key concerns that the Indian regulator uh, would have uh, with uh, with rampant use of cryptocurrencies is the capital flight. Which uh, you know, if uh, when it comes to fiat, of course, you regulate flow of fiat outside of the country because it is all through banking channels, which are regulated. But uh, with cryptocurrencies, people can easily transfer money outside uh, under the radar, right? Now, how can some of these technologies or maybe newer solutions possibly be used uh, to restrict this activity or you know, uh, uh, confirm compliance, et cetera? Uh, so I think like the industry is moving towards that um, in the sense, like uh, there's, there's something called the FATF travel rule. Now, uh, without going into too much detail, uh, what it says is if there are two cryptocurrency entities like virtual asset service providers interacting, they like say Anirudh from Coinbase sends uh, money like crypto Bitcoin to Mrikank who's in on Kraken. Then Kraken and Coinbase need to share beneficiary and recipient details. Similar to how banks currently share data, like if you send me money via your bank network. Now, um, I think there's still a lot of uncertainty on in which way it will be implemented across different exchanges. But as that happens, and secondly, as um, more and more cryptocurrency companies get regulated, then I think regulators can put in certain regulations which prevent capital flight, at least for um, like a large number of cases, right? Like they can, suppose a regulator licensed a cryptocurrency exchange in India and said that they should warn the regulator in case there are transactions to foreign exchanges or the regulator has access to that list, then uh, at least they're aware of the capital flight and then they can clamp down on it through other methods, right? Sure. I would say capital flight can best be prevented through regulation rather than like complete ban because then it just moves underground anyways. You know, I mean, the industry was so sick and tired of the RBI's approach that at some point uh, uh, we approached the RBI with a very extreme solution, which is to say that well, all exchanges in India should be should be licensed. Uh, only licensed exchanges obviously will uh, will allow transactions, and cryptos will not move outside of this network of licensed exchanges at all. So you, the RBI, can remain completely comfortable that money is not leaving the country or it's not even leaving these exchanges. Um, and the RBI did not even agree to that, right? So, so that was the level of kind of, um, you know, conservatism um, that was, you know, uh, that crept in to the, into the system. But, uh, but uh, yeah, I, I mean, I, I hope at some point uh, with, with, with these kind of solutions, technologies, et cetera, we can, we can have regulators become more, uh, more and more open about, uh, you know, uh, cryptocurrencies uh, generally. Uh, on that uh -huh. uh, Yes. Anirudh, uh, from your perspective, how do you see the cryptocurrency landscape in India evolving? Like, do you do you foresee any regulations coming out in the next year or two? So 
it's, it's, it's anybody's guess, to be honest, uh, uh, but um, I, I would be surprised if it takes that long. Um, I'm, I'm pretty certain that there would be some kind of regulation one way or the other sooner than that. And uh, there are only already extraneous circumstances that are, uh, uh, you know, around us in India uh, that are likely to drive that kind of uh, rapid, uh, uh, you know, that, that are going to precipitate a need for regulation. Uh, so just the number of scams, for example, that have or extortions that have risen in the uh, in the last one and a half odd months, right? Um, uh, of course, it has all been, all been exacerbated because of the, the COVID situation, but just the number of clients who we are helping out right now with uh, with these kind of uh, situations is, uh, is is quite troublesome. So I'm pretty sure that uh, you know uh, all of this is going to uh, drive us in the direction of some regulation, one way or the other. I'm not going to comment which which way it is going to go, uh, but that's that. The second thing is uh, there are quite a number of murmurs uh, that in 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 the last one week that uh, the RBI has started to uh, uh, you know, kind of uh, talk about the sovereign currency business all over again, right? And uh, uh, so that's that's the other uh, kind of uh, angle which uh, which uh, I, I think we will soon be grappling with. What is your sense, by the way? And uh, I mean, uh, whether from the perspective of you know uh, AML, CFT, or uh, forensics and diligence, or otherwise a general view that you have on uh, on sovereign currencies, I, I think it will definitely be a trend. Uh, yes, I mean, um, like uh, initially, I did think that sovereign currencies would take uh, a lot longer, and I think that might be uh, like the case in some countries. But we do see uh, like central bank digital currencies, um, like a lot of adoption, a lot of work going on in it. Uh, it's still very early days to see how they can implement it. Like, um, of course, I've read some interesting articles on how China is trying to go about it, but. Um, uh, to me, I think that there's definitely a world where central bank digital currencies would exist, but I, I don't think that would effectively like mean that digital like other cryptocurrencies don't exist. They, there would probably be a world where both coexist together. So it like the solution to cryptocurrency can't be to come up with a central bank digital currency. There would be certain advantages of a central bank digital currency, of course. But um, of course, the decentralization. Um, and uh, like the fact that it's not controlled by a government is a very important factor in favor of cryptocurrencies. So um, they would operate like how things operate right now, where there's like a combination of different methods, like how credit cards operate in tandem with bank transfers and Paytm. So maybe like even in the like digital asset space, there would be different segments like this, each having their own pros and cons. Someone wants to know how is uh, Merkel Science working with law enforcement agencies and other stakeholders in India? Sure, sure. Uh, so I think um, India is still a fairly new market for us only because, uh, I mean, in the early days, although we're both Indian co-founders, we realized there wasn't a huge market in the early days. So, um, but now like that the Supreme Court or now that crypto exchanges have become more bullish in the market, we are definitely planning to get in touch with all of them. Uh, we've done some trainings for law enforcement in India, and uh, we will connect with them now to find out how they could potentially use us. Uh, we, we don't have a very active business like in terms of the like, customers in India, but uh, we're definitely going to make a push now that we feel that the market is opening up. There's a lot more interest around it. And I, I feel that like, um, at least from our interactions with law enforcement, uh, there's definitely a lot of interest in that segment, so maybe we'll start with that segment. And but I, I see a lot of exchanges coming about as well, and they want to definitely now have some that's regulatory friendly, like not just for the Indian government, as they also see the FATF guidelines are being adopted. So they want to have like this in place in case they are ever questioned by their bank or by regulators as to how you operating an exchange, do you follow the right AML CFT policies. So I think the market is just opening up now. So it's a focus for us in the next uh, couple of months. Certainly. Um, Ashish asks something which concerns uh, a lot of us. What is the best response when you get a threat from an attacker? For example, servers hacked by attackers and asked to transfer BTC to some address or maybe some other preventive measures. Right, so uh, I think the best response is um, Contacting like law enforcement, contacting your local police. So, 
um, if like you um, and a like I think you always need to check whether the threat is real as well. Like very often we see threats where the person claims that like um, they've recorded your you like through your webcam and they're going to publish nude pictures of you online. But like the, that's just like a bluff and like but people still fall for it and they end up sending Bitcoin as like ransom to this. So if you're like servers have been attacked then you definitely want to first check like or if someone's claiming your servers have been attacked you definitely want to first check whether they've been attacked and then i don't think sending btc is like the best step maybe first contact law enforcement and then it's up to you to decide like it depends on the gravity of the problem if you think that like your servers will get free by like just sending btc then you can try it out but definitely working closely with law enforcement or even like you can also shoot out an email to us and working with forensics companies such as us uh, also like helps like we we would actively help you try and recover more information on this are you you're able to work with individuals as well uh, we don't typically work with individuals but um, like the, we decide that on a case by case basis actually depending on the on the complexity it's um, it's like most of the time there's a paid arrangement that we require but um, Sometimes, I mean, if law enforcement asks us for some help, we're happy to do it like ad hoc anyway. Understood, understood. So, Mrigan, kind of to, um, you know, we, we spoke about uh, the kind of movement in regulations and banking, et cetera, across uh, different uh, jurisdictions. But there's one jurisdiction you understand particularly well, which we did not talk about too much. Uh, and, uh, you know, when you were, when you were with uh, the uh, Luno, the crypto exchange, uh, you uh, led their, ex, uh, their kind of uh, expansion into Southeast Asia, which was of course Singapore, but also Malaysia and some other countries in the region. Um, have you, uh, do you continue to track these regions? How, how are things, how, how have things been in, in the rest of Southeast Asia over the last couple of years? Uh, so I think like um, this is a good question, at least from an Indian perspective. They've, like even countries, I mean, Singapore has obviously been uh, one step ahead in terms of financial services. But even, and they're much smaller, so the, the, it's easier for them to regulate something and execute it. So they've obviously like been very proactive in the space, but uh, even other Southeast Asian countries that might compare to India, like in terms of size or population, like are much larger, like Malaysia, uh, they've also come up with like frameworks and like a proper regulatory regime for cryptocurrency licenses. So I think there are three cryptocurrency exchanges that have been licensed in Malaysia and actually two of them work with us. The regulators are also very uh, proactive, like they actively work, like set up meetings with the industry, set up meetings with providers such as ours, and um, they, they make sure that there's enough communication that they do to all these counterparties. I think that's a very good way of going about it. And uh, especially Singapore as well, like once they decided that they were going to regulate this, they literally spoke to every single company, like starting from the smallest startup to the larger cryptocurrency exchanges, uh, had multiple dialogues with them to um, make sure that they understand it. And um, I, I've seen them even like having uh, these sessions, like there's a Singapore FinTech Association where the MAS conducts these webinars, like to give updates on regulation and even encourages questions, like just like uh, all these questions here, they would encourage as many questions from industry participants as possible so that um, they get a different perspective on that as well and they can use that as data points for what they execute or how they they use that for a better understanding of the market as well so ideally i think the best way is for india to uh, go about implementing this uh, in that fashion as well right uh, you know, um, but I've had a little bit of a mixed experience with Singapore, and I, I think it's worth talking about Singapore because a lot of the crypto industry in India uh, chooses to either have folding vehicles in Singapore or or set up their kind of operations out of Singapore as well for multiple multiple reasons. One, it's the same time zone; it's an accessible jurisdiction; it's a jurisdiction India Indians understand well, and then also you know the crypto friendly regulatory approach to a certain extent. And that's where I want to talk about the risk experience, which is that, yes, Singapore, the regulators have done everything to understand the industry, to understand the concerns, 
they have gone ahead and uh, given some kind of regulatory uh, under, you know kind of uh, clarity but they have stopped short of giving complete clarity on things right and they sort of reserve the uh, you know so, so so the industry is also always trying to second guess you know that there are they're not saying no but they're not giving you a very a, a, a yes with complete conviction either and uh, you're, you're always you're always a little worried so I, I don't know if you see that changing now or, uh, or you know, what is your sense of uh, regulations in Singapore going forward? Of course, there are people so, in I mean, uh, I think like, like there is a, like a DPD license in Singapore, right? And um, they can't give you complete clarity on everything because like, then that means that like, they're leaving out edge cases where you can exploit that and actually do something wrong. And also like, a lot of things are something they want to try and impose stricter measures on over time. Like if they, and they want to leave certain space in terms of regulation or clarity in terms of that. But if you go through like their website and uh, like the amount of guidance or documentation they've provided is uh, definitely sufficient um, for a company with cryptocurrency ambitions in Singapore, right? So um, like I do think that like, 100% clarity cannot be provided by anyone because it's a fast growing space and there are just too many changes since the time they draft it to when they publish it there could be a few changes and things could change completely there as well but um, at least um, most geographies are making an attempt um, uh, I, I, I'm getting a warning of low bandwidth uh, is my voice clear Anirudh? It's, it's clear don't, don't worry about it Sure, sure. So uh, at least like uh, they're making an attempt towards it, right? Like even in traditional finance, there is not no 100% clarity on any item, right? And except the ones that are very well known, like in like relatively new spaces, there's no 100% clarity and um, it would be similar in this. And in fact, the problem is more acute in this because things in the crypto world change much faster. Certainly. So I'm going to only throw two more questions at you. One is a question from the from the audience. Uh, does your business also verify entities issuing utility tokens? Uh, yes. So we do um, do um, items like that. So like if they're issuing utility tokens, then uh, and there are transactions for those utility tokens, you can. Um, I'm assuming that this is uh, asking about like a business, like you're trying to get a certain the risk profile of a business. So you can definitely ask for something called a know your blockchain business report. So that would give you like the crypto risk of these entities and um, and the tokens and transactions that have occurred for this business. Um, and there's like, in terms of these entities, uh, like you, it can even be for your own company because you can use this like to show to others that have, at least you've made an attempt to quantify your risk profile or like to get like the risk profile from an external third party. Sure. So my last question, Rigank, is um, when you decided to leave Luno, why did you, uh, how did you come about this idea? How did you decide to start Merkle? And if not Merkle, was, was a competing idea as well? Was there another crypto um, uh, you know, idea in the crypto industry, which, uh, which you were also exploring and you know, ultimately went to Merkle, but, but if, if that, then why? Why not? <clears throat> Sorry, uh, yeah. Sure, sure. So I think um, when, uh, when I quit uh, Luno, it like, I think um, the idea like was the, the perspective was entirely that Cryptocurrency is a new industry and like new industries mean new opportunities. So definitely the potential to start like a billion dollar business catering to this new industry in certain segments. And um, I had figured out that like, because of my experience with Luno that reg tech or uh, cyber security would definitely be a major theme uh, across. And um, that's why like, like Merkle science or like things around AML, CFT, things around crypto crime was definitely one of the categories I was looking at. Um, I think a few other categories I was looking at was more around, again, like, again, cybersecurity, like smart contract audits. And um, then the last one was more around, like I noticed there was an acute shortage of blockchain developers around that IC boom. 
So the last one was more around like starting like a niche platform for blockchain training and and jobs. But um, I think like I found my co-founder Nirmal. He had the best complementary skill set for this particular idea. He had worked as a fraud data scientist at PayPal. So I, I think on account of that, we just started with this. We um, at that point it was very difficult to ascertain which one was the right way to go. But then like later, what happened is this industry just like took off. So now we're very certain that this is definitely the industry we should have started up in. Certainly. Well, uh, great, Megank. Uh, thank you so much for that. Um, I think I, I really enjoyed the uh, enjoyed the talk. Fully agree with you that red tech, especially in the crypto industry, is the next big thing. Um, as I said earlier, the future of the blockchain industry will be intricately linked with the future of these technologies. Um, I really wish that when we were in the Supreme Court um, uh, arguing uh, for over two years about you know uh, all of these uh, kind of risks around use of cryptocurrencies, if, if we could have demoed these solutions and talked more intelligently about them in the court, um, uh, that could have been lovely as well. And I, I think there's still time to take some of this, um, some of this thinking, this um, uh, you know all of this technology to the RBI um, and uh, and other regulators around the world. Uh, so thank you very much. It was very, very insightful. And I'm very glad to see also that, uh, you know, there are a lot of uh, friends in the audience, uh, old colleagues and other stakeholders from the cryptocurrency industry, clients, et cetera. Thank you all for uh, for joining us and uh, hope you found it as helpful as I did. Thank you, Anirudh. Thank you, Mrigang, for a very insightful presentation. Uh, before we leave, we would just like... Everyone, bye. Yeah, oh, sorry. Yeah, I, I didn't mean to cut you. <laughs> Please. Um, before we leave, we would just like to inform everyone of our next webinar, wherein we will examine telemedicine practice in India and the laws surrounding it. Again, we will have an industry expert with us, Mr. Manoj Gurg, from the found, co founder of MyUpchar. Uh, hope to have another insightful conversation next Friday and hope to see you all there again. Thank you, everyone.